So welcome everybody to this wonderful Wellbeing of Women uh, seminar or webinar. It's entitled Let's End Pelvic Health Taboos. And we've got an all-star cast, we really have. Now, just quickly before we start, I just want to remind everybody on the platform, and I understand that it's a record number of attendees on the platform today, so fantastic, and thank you for joining us, that Wellbeing of Women is the only charity that supports every aspects of women's health, research, education, and advocacy right across the life course. And I think that what you will hear from the panelists today is how incredibly important it is that we stop hiding the problems of pelvic floor ill health and that we actually talk very positively about the importance of pelvic health. And we're going to start uh, initially with a, a presentation from um, Helen Ledwick, who has very kindly agreed to share her uh, discussion about that, um, uh, her own personal journey. But before I do that, I'm going to ask Rani Thacker, who is my friend, my colleague, and also uh, one of my successors as president of the RCOG, uh, but most importantly for this webinar, is a real expert on pelvic floor health. So what I thought would be helpful is if we started off by just discussing what we mean by pelvic floor health uh, and what we mean by all the terminology which and all the acronyms which can be confusing for people who are non-medical. And then we'll set the scene and then we're going to go on to talk to Helen and she's very kindly um, agreed that she would discuss this, um, uh, discuss her journey and you'll see in her background, she's got that rather plaintive placard, Why Mums Don't Jump. It's a great, it's a great book. Um, and she very kindly supplied me with a copy. And then I'm going to move on to Emma Brockwell, who's going to be talking about the importance of physiotherapy as first line treatment. And then I'm going to come back to Rane uh, to talk about specialist care, because I think the beginning of our webinar is going to be focused very much on the pregnancy journey. And then I think Rane will be able to help us push it into context of the, the whole journey across the woman's life course. So with that, Rane, you're going to make it all seem very clear so everybody knows what we're talking about. Over to you, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And as you know, I'm absolutely passionate about pelvic floor dysfunction. And I think it's something that can be prevented. Um, and, and the education in this area needs to start right from school. And we don't do that very well, do we? In fact, we don't even do it well when women get incontinence and, and at the touch point of pregnancy and postnatal care. So, so hopefully by the end of this webinar, we will have a little bit of a more awareness about this issue and see what each one of us can do to, to help women with uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. I think it's really important to start with the definition of what is the pelvic floor, because I think people don't actually know what we talk about. Uh, so very often in clinic, I'll say, well, you know, you've got pelvic floor dysfunction and the patient looks at me and says, what are you talking about? What is the pelvic floor? So I thought we'd show you some, a slide of what is the pelvic floor because there's nothing like pictures, Great. isn't there? And I hope you can see this well. Um, excellent. Can you see that? Yes, so, excellent. very clear. Okay, uh, so now, and you can see the whole slide or... Let me see, you can see the thing on the side as well. So, so this is what the pelvic floor is. It's made of muscle and connective tissue, layers of, of muscle, it's quite thick. And it extends from the front, that is the pubic bone, and to your coccyx, so what we call the tailbone. But it's not just a long muscle, it, it is a, a, it's almost like a hammock. And on the side, it goes to your sitting bones, or what is known as ischial tuberosity. And what I want you to notice in this particular picture is the bladder, the womb and the vagina, and behind you have the bowel and the anal canal. Now look how closely these organs are connected. What that means is that when you have a problem with one of your organs, you're likely to have a problem with the other organs as well. So pelvic floor dysfunction, over 60% of women will complain of at least one symptom of pelvic floor dysfunction. And we come to the definition of what we mean by pelvic floor dysfunction. Now we are concentrating on the anatomy. What I need you to also notice is how this pelvic floor 
keeps all the pelvic organs in one place. And this is a, another view of the pelvic uh, of the whole pelvic floor. And you can see that it is it is a muscle that spans the outlet of the pelvic floor. And all the organs actually go through little holes within this muscle. Uh, now, the very fact that this muscle has got tone means that we women are not incontinent or we are not incontinent as we uh, sit where, where we are sitting right now. So this is what helps maintain continence and helps prevent passing of wind, for example. So, so it, it's really important. Now, the next thing is, why do women get pelvic floor dysfunction? which essentially is incontinence of urine, it can be incontinence of stools or wind or prolapse. So as I said earlier, women can have a combination of this and this makes treatment of pelvic floor dysfunction sometimes quite a challenge. Um, so why do women get pelvic floor dysfunction? The muscle that I showed you keeps the organs in place. When this muscle gets damaged or weak, and that can happen during childbirth, you can get incontinence, prolapse, or, or even dysfunction or incontinence of your bowels. And this can be both for stools and, and wind. So if anybody has these symptoms, it's really important that you contact a healthcare professional. There are different kinds of treatment for this. And one is uh, pelvic floor muscle exercises. And in the RCOG, we did a survey of almost 2000 women. And I'll tell you the statistics. And this might surprise some of you. One in four women had never done pelvic floor muscle exercises. One in five had experienced urinary incontinence. Of those who experienced symptoms, over half, 53%, had not seek, seek help for this issue. And a lot of women don't do that because they think it's part of normal life or they are too embarrassed to do that, to ask for help. So it's, it's really important that we seek help for these issues. So I think, uh, Leslie, I've laid the scene there. Perfect, Rani. Thank you so much. Now, if only every medical student got talked about hammocks and every midwife talked about hammocks, you immediately get a picture, don't you, of the various tubes reaching in their, in their um, travel to the exterior, having to go through that hammock. So a great, great start. So now on to Helen. Um, now, Helen, in addition to being someone who's going to share her journey with us today and the author of Why Mums Don't Jump, is also a former BBC journalist and an award-winning podcast creator. So uh, who better to share her journey with us? And thank you so much for coming and joining us. As I said earlier, we've got the largest um, platform of attendees that we've ever had for a wellbeing webinar. So you um, are obviously going to be a very popular uh, and it's going to be recorded You're just responding to some of the questions in the chat it will be recorded and the wonderful well-being team will send everybody who's registered for this webinar a link tomorrow so Helen over to you uh, thanks for having me um, so this all started for me eight years ago a couple of weeks after my son was born my second child I was feeding him on the sofa and when I stood up Suddenly, things did not feel right. I'd had a third degree tear during the birth, so I wasn't in good shape anyway, but this was different. I had this feeling of a bulge, like I was losing a tampon. So I went upstairs, I took out a hand mirror, and I started Googling what I could see, as you do, uh, which is where I heard the word prolapse for the first time in my life, and how I found out that I had one. And I was reading that my insides were falling out. And this was so shocking to me that I nearly called an ambulance there and then. But thankfully, I was still under the care of a midwife. So I texted her instead. And that was kind of the start of it, really. And over weeks and months, I came to understand that this was not something that was just going to go away on its own and that it you know, could well get worse with age. I understood 
at the time, the way I heard it was that my options would be surgery or just put up with it. And despite having a level of medical care and despite being a journalist, I really struggled to understand what it was, what it meant and what I should or shouldn't do about it. And because no one ever talked about it, I just felt very isolated, very confused. And for me, one of the, the hardest things was that the advice certainly at the time was to avoid high impact exercise. So running, jumping, lifting. And I'd always been quite an active person, but I became really afraid of movement after that. So certainly no netball, no gym time, but also digging the garden or lifting my kids or chasing them around in the park. I would find myself saying, you know, mummy isn't strong. Mummy can't do that. It's not me. It made me feel really sad. Um, and that that's kind of how it was for a couple of years. And all I thought about was my prolapse. <laughs> the discomfort of the bulge was like a constant reminder of all the things that I felt I couldn't do anymore. I was back at work with two preschoolers, getting on with life, but, you know, just not in a great place. And then I was turning 40. And I think, as we so often do, reassessing everything in my life. And around that time, I bumped into another mum at the Trafford Centre, which is this massive shopping centre on the outskirts of Manchester. There's a big dolphin fountain in the middle where kids throw coins. And uh, we, we got chatting. And we before and we knew it, we'd both declared that we had these prolapses. Um, she was on her way to the trampoline park, which is how that came about. And she gave me a number for her physio. And I started to wonder if actually there was more that I could do to rehabilitate. Um, but it also gave me this sense that this was a conversation that it was possible to have. It was OK to talk about it. And it wasn't long after that that I started on Instagram as Why Mums Don't Jump. And in no time at all, I was getting messages from women thanking me for sharing my story, which mirrored their own. Right. So the grief that you feel for your former self, the self blame, you know, what I've had made different birth decisions what if I'd done more pelvic floor exercise what if I hadn't strained on the loo or lifted my toddler and we're all going through all these same emotions on our own hiding on the internet and sharing our deepest fears with strangers because we're, we're too afraid to even say it out loud or even with our nearest and dearest so um I decided to start a podcast not just about prolapse, but incontinence, pelvic pain, all these problems that Ronnie's mentioned that are so common after childbirth and menopause and then forever after. And yeah, my background is as a radio producer, so I was comfortable with the technical side of things, less comfortable with the speaking about my vagina in public side of things. I'm still getting used to that. Um, but I just, I wanted to give people the information and support that I had found so hard to find. So it's a mix of expert voices and women's stories. And um, the response, I can't, I mean, I can never really articulate. It's been huge and it's blown me awake because the emails and messages arrive every day from around the world, sometimes like emails with whole word documents attached and these heart-wrenching stories of women who can't bend to bathe their kids without leaking or have given up activities that they love or even jobs sometimes because they're in discomfort or pain or they're struggling with leaks or they're skipping meals to avoid embarrassing accidents and they're sitting on bin bags in the car or even unable to leave the house. You, you like, It creeps into relationships obviously has an impact on your social life, who you are as a person. It might not be life-threatening, but the impact is huge. And, you know, so often, sadly, I hear, and it doesn't help that women are told again and again that it's normal when you have a baby, a natural consequence of childbirth, just part of aging. Uh, one woman told me that she'd been, she said, fobbed off by a doctor several months after her daughter was born, despite the fact that she couldn't walk without leaking and despite being a doctor herself. You know, the education and the awareness for professionals and for patients is just not there yet. So we just carry on. And sometimes we carry on for decades without understanding that we could do more. But when we can talk about it, then things start to change. Um, I had this email from a listener in California. She was 59 years old and she'd never heard of prolapse until she was diagnosed a month earlier. And she was really angry about that because she said she'd seen a gynecologist every year of her adult life and she had no idea it was possible. 
but she'd listened to the podcast and now she was channeling that rage into throwing what she called a, a vagina tea party for her female mm. family and friends so that they would know, right? So that they, maybe they wouldn't go through the same thing. And that's the kind of magic that has happened since opening up these conversations. Through um, Instagram, I met a couple of women who both have prolapse. We started hanging out locally for coffee and gin and discussing our vaginal woes, which sounds crazy, but it really helped. And we called it our pop club and I got them on the podcast. And then other women started asking, oh, where can we find our pop, our pop clubs? And we ended up with these very unofficial groups popping up all over the country. Um, the most memorable of which was a couple of women in uh, Ayrshire who went roller skating around a very posh local golf course. And they told me, uh, let's just say the golf has got an education that evening, which was just this vision that I'll always treasure. Um, it was a listener who volunteered her time to design the branding for Why Moms Don't Jump, the illustrations in the book. Another listener who was an animation lecturer got me involved with her students who've produced the most amazing short film using clips from the podcast. And of course, the book, which only came about because, again, another listener was a literary agent and she just shared my passion for ending this taboo. So this is why the community is important, because it helps women to feel less alone and it gives them hope. And from there, my thinking is we can learn and we can understand that treatments do exist. We can advocate for ourselves and know that we don't need to hide in silence and shame. Um, and just to finish, I, I don't obviously have all the answers. <laughs> I obviously do still have a prolapse, but I'm much better than I was. And I jog around the park, I dance around the kitchen, I lift heavy things it doesn't consume me anymore. And I know everyone's journey will be different. Some people have worse symptoms than I do, but um, yeah, there's just so much that can be done once we can have these conversations. So thank you for having this conversation and inviting me to be part of it. Now that's so important. Thank you so much. And as you rightly say, it's just about starting it. And if you talk about something enough, you'll suddenly one day find that people are telling you back what you've told them previously. And you think, yes, it's out there now. Um, one of the things that I've been saying a great deal recently in my role as Women's Health Ambassador to the government is that, uh, you know, we, you may talk about periods and you may talk about the menopause now because it's all been made OK to talk about them. But do you go to, you know, do you talk about one in three or one in four women leaking urine uh, when you're at a dinner party or at a, or at a reception? You, know, you tend not to. So well done, Helen. And thank you for your book and for your passion and also for all those, you know, inspiring all those people that have reached out to help you really, really um, spread the word and, and get it all out there. So I'm going to move on, as I said, to Emma Brockwell now. She's a very specialist pelvic health um, physiotherapist and she treats women of all, um, uh, all ages and with all sorts of different conditions. But we're going to start talking, I think, about the uh, preconception and, and during antenatal care and the post conception or postnatal um, uh, physiotherapy firstly and then if you want to broaden it then I'm sure the audience will be delighted to hear that too so over to you Emma thank you so much for coming to join us thank you very much for having me um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to so many people about what I do and the exciting fact that there is a lot you can do if you are suffering with pelvic floor dysfunction as as, uh, as, as described by Rani. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you and hope that it works. Um, and let me just get my slide up and hope you can all see that. Is that, is that viewable? Great. Um, so I'm a pelvic health physiotherapist. Um, so I am someone who I hope you would see if you suffer from pelvic floor dysfunction. And I hope you'd be the, I'd be the first person you see once you've discussed this potentially with your GP. And the reason that I'd love for you to see me is simply because we're really good at treating pelvic floor dysfunction. And actually in terms of stress urinary incontinence, about 80 to 85% of women can actually resolve, if not more effectively manage the symptoms of stress urinary incontinence if they see a pelvic health physiotherapist. So as per the NICE guidance, ideally you should see us first, 
regardless of the type of pelvic floor dysfunction you have. And you would ideally see us for quite a few months if you have pelvic organ pro prolapse, like Helen has described, stress urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence. And you'll see us for a few months simply because it takes months to resolve these issues. But as I say, they can be hopefully resolved with this form of treatment. I'm very passionate about preventative management. Um, I truly believe that every woman um, should be educated from a really young age about pelvic floor dysfunction and pelvic health. And in doing so, wouldn't it be great? Because we, I, I feel like we, you know, avoid a lot of these these issues that women are commonly um, experiencing. Um, as per the guidance uh, from Nice, it does recommend that when you're pregnant, if you uh, commence pelvic floor exercises during your pregnancy that's a really good place to start and then continue to do that postpartum regardless of whether you're experiencing any symptoms um, certainly it recommends that if you have unfortunately had postpartum um, an assisted vaginal birth using forceps or von Tuse, a vaginal birth where the baby is laying face up or an injury to the anal sphincter which Rani discussed then ideally you should see a, a pelvic health physiotherapist even if you haven't experienced any symptoms so that we can reduce the chances of those symptoms occurring later in life. You can see us by speaking to your GP, they can refer you to an NHS physio, and the NHS physios are amazing, they are just incredibly overworked, um, and so therefore the waiting lists are long, but I would encourage you to stay on those waiting lists if you cannot see someone privately, and of course we do exist privately, but there's a cost involved with that. Um, so please reach out to your GP. In some areas, you can self-refer to see us as well. So we're there, we exist, and we want to help you. I want to just talk to you about the type of things that we do, um, because I think there's a lot of uncertainty as to what we do. Um, and I want to demystify that to encourage you to come and see us. Um, when you first see us, you would typically be offered a vaginal assessment. You don't have to have that, but it's certainly very helpful. And from a vaginal assessment, we can ascertain why you're experiencing the symptoms you're experiencing. This is just another picture here of the pelvic floor, and it really clearly shows here the urethra, the vagina and the anus. And we would typically offer you a vaginal assessment so we can ascertain what is going on with your pelvic floor. As well as assessing your pelvic floor, we will also look at you as a whole because lo and behold, the pelvic floor is not the only um, muscle that helps support the pelvic organs and our urogenital system. We have to be thinking about you as a whole. So we would look at the other muscles that work with the pelvic floor. This might include your glute, your bottom muscles, your tummy muscles. It might also include your core as well. So your diaphragm, your deep tummy, your deep back muscles, they're all intimately linked to the pelvic floor. And so we shouldn't just be thinking of the pelvic floor in isolation we should be thinking about how we can strengthen you up on the outside as well as on the inside so as to optimize your pelvic floor strength and hopefully reduce and resolve your symptoms we of course will discuss with you lifestyle changes that we would recommend and if you are suffering with pelvic floor dysfunction now and you haven't yet seen a pelvic health physiotherapist these are things you can consider so if for example you are overweight we know that by reducing your weight that will certainly help improve symptoms of stress urinary incontinence for sure we do talk about physical activity Helen touched on the fact that she loves to run um, and I am a huge advocate of anyone exercising but we know that higher impact exercise can sometimes exacerbate these symptoms and I'm very much encouraged um all women to exercise because we know that it can improve pelvic floor dysfunction but it's finding the exercise that works for you at the time to help improve your symptoms and my goal is always to get women back to the exercise like running that they want to do whilst reducing their symptoms but we do know that it's important to be physically active to help improve your symptoms we of course talk about fluid intake we'll i'll often see in clinic women don't drink enough because they're fearful of leakage and the irony is that can contribute to some of your symptoms so we talk about how you can uh, you know address that intake and and make for a healthier uh, bladder as well but we also talk about your diet because your gut health is intrinsically linked to your pelvic health if you are suffering from constipation then unfortunately that is likely to exacerbate signs and symptoms of pelvic floor dysfunction so straight 
straining, bearing down. That's something we try and discourage so as to prevent pelvic organ prolapse, but also to improve it as well. And thinking about getting a little stool under your feet so it raises your knees higher than your hips, that can help relax the pelvic floor and help you avoid straining and therefore actually improve your symptoms. So as I say, it's not just about pelvic floor exercises um, to improve your symptoms. But of course, we do talk about pelvic floor exercises. Um, they are, let's say, my bread and butter. Um, and whilst they may not be the most exciting exercise, I would encourage, even if you haven't got pelvic floor issues, to start doing them. The best place to do them is in an upright position, so seated, ideally standing, because that then helps the muscle develop and change when it's up against your body weight and gravity. Two cues that are most effective to use are to consider squeezing your back and your front passage. So your back passage here and your front passage. And by doing that, that should cause a, a lift um, and a squeeze around those areas, whilst also feeling a sensation of lift around the perineum, the bridge between these two areas here. We want you to think about holding for a long period of time, so up to 10 seconds, but also quickly squeezing the pelvic floor as well. And that is because the pelvic floor consists of slow twitch fibers as well as fast twitch fibers. So that is why we encourage long holds and short holds. And of course, we encourage a daily habitual habit so that you get into the rhythm of doing your pelvic floor exercises, just as you would brush your teeth twice a day. It's ideal to do your pelvic floor exercises every day as well. You'll know if you're perhaps doing them incorrectly, which can I just add is really common. Lots of us do do our pelvic floor exercises incorrectly. And that's that's I guess where I come in because I can really show you with a, through a vaginal assessment how to do your pelvic floor exercises. But if you haven't got someone like me, just think when you're doing that squeeze of your front and your back passage, are you holding your breath? Are you squeezing your bum cheeks? Are you bracing your tummy? Are you grimacing? If you're doing those things, that could be a sign that you're perhaps doing those exercises slightly incorrectly. And that, again, is where you would want to see someone like myself to help. Or you could look at uh, some biofeedback. We've got things like the LV here. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but this little green probe down here, that would insert into the vagina. And as you squeeze that device, that would send messages to your phone and it would give you some feedback as to tell you whether or not you're squeezing your pelvic floor. And then it would create a program for you. The Kegel 8 is something similar as well that we recommend. And then, of course, to create that habit, there are lots of apps. Um, the Squeezy app is one of the most uh, well known. It's $2.99 um, and it sends you reminders to do your pelvic floor exercises. But of course, it also tells you how to do them as well. So there is so much you can do to help simply manage your pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, and as I say, for the majority of women, that will be as far as you need to go with your pelvic floor journey and hopefully things will resolve. But of course, there are many other options, including pessaries. Um, and I'm going to leave that um, to Rani to discuss further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emma. That's so helpful. Um, lots and lots and lots of comments in the chat about how helpful this is. Um, and I think that the answer to yes, can you share this um, recording? Of course, you can share it. The great thing about well-being of women is they don't do territory. Anything we've got, you can sh we'll share with you. Uh, and please circulate it to your friends and your colleagues at work, um, anyone who would be interested. Thank you so much. Now, Rani, you, you started this off so well, and I love that analogy with the hammock, because and I think everybody did. Everyone was nodding at me when I said that. But you're going to talk a little bit as well now, aren't you, about all the other things that are, that are important and that present to you and various treatments. So the physio is the first line. So what happens when they come in and see Dr. Thacker uh, at Croydon uh, in your specialist clinic? So, so you're, you're absolutely right. So when I get my patient, and I almost never see a patient unless they've had conservative management, or if they do come to me first, I will always send them to see my continence nurse or physiotherapist. And in fact, I've worked quite closely with Emma uh, and, and we tend to, to work together very well. So I think when we are talking about pelvic floor dysfunction, we must bear in mind that it's not just one professional involved. There are various professionals involved and each one has a role and it's about respecting each other's territory, working together because then 
that's the best way we can provide care to our patients. So, so let's imagine that you're my patient here. I would ask my patients uh, about their symptoms. As I said earlier, often women who have symptoms of one compartment, we call it, so say the bladder is the anterior compartment, would say if you have urinary incontinence, it's really important to find out whether they also have incontinence uh, of feces and whether they can hold wind, whether they have problems with sexual dysfunction, because often women have sexual pro problems because they have incontinence. It's nothing to do with sexual activities because they feel dirty. It's because they they just can't bear the thought of having leaking when having intercourse. So, so it's also very important to ask about sexual activity, and we must not be ashamed to ask about this. Um, the, and then the other thing is, is something coming out of your vagina, and that is prolapse. So as I said, the pelvic flow muscles keep your organs in place. When there's a weakness, there's literally a dropping down of the pelvic organs, and that is what we call prolapse. So the symptom I would ask about is, do you feel a lump in your vagina? And then I would move on to find out why this person has got issues. Um, somebody asked, are there other causes for incontinence or pelvic floor dysfunction within the questions? So, so the questions I would therefore ask would be to find out the cause for the pelvic floor dysfunction. So they would be, do you have a chronic cough? Do you smoke? Because any increased pressure on the pelvic floor can cause pelvic floor dysfunction. So it's not just vaginal delivery, and it's important to remember that. Obesity, again, we do know that when women reduce their weight, the incontinence gets better, and they may not need any surgery or anything. So obesity is a big issue uh, currently, and it's something we need to, to focus on uh, because actually just resolving that issue will improve health in lots of ways, including incontinence. And the number of times I have worked with my patients and said, okay, let's not do anything now. You do your pelvic floor muscle exercises. Your job is to reduce your weight and then I will operate on you if necessary. And they come back to me and say, I've reduced my weight. My incontinence is better. I say, thank you very much. You don't need surgery. And then there are other causes as well, such as neurological conditions. So you can get symptoms of overactive bladder if you have uh, diseases such as multiple sclerosis. So it's important to ask about other diseases as well and what medications people are taking. So there are some medications that are actually cause pelvic floor problems or urinary incontinence, some that cause constipation. And I would almost never operate on somebody unless I resolve constipation and chronic cough. Because guess what? Your operation will fail. Oh. And the first, the success is your first operation. The repeated operations that you do are more likely to fail. So I avoid surgery when I can. I work with people like Emma and, and then, um, you know, try and resolve the issue without any surgery. The other thing to bear in mind that as women get older, the lack of estrogens weakens the pelvic floor connective tissue. Uh, and reduce it as well. And that can, again, cause issues with your bladder, bowel, and sexual dysfunction, because these women can get pain due to lack of estrogen. So age and menopause is another risk factor. So once I've gone through those parts of my history, I'm also looking to see whether there are any red flags. And by red flags, I mean have they got blood in their urine? Do they get rec recurrent urinary tract infections? Because those may be the situations where I need to refer that patient or do a cystoscopy that is have a look within the inside the bladder to see whether there are any conditions like bladder cancer or refer them to the bowel surgeons if they've got blood in their poo. So it's also important to take a history of these red flag symptoms because Emma might not be able to help them or shouldn't be seeing her first uh, because we need to rule out any of these situations wherein they may have underlying cancer. So really history taking is so important and that's what I try and tell my medical students. It's not the robotic surgery or anything that's important. It's these little things that you do. History is, is most important. And then obviously it's the examination. Um, 
And then it comes to what exactly my patient wants. So when you take a history of pelvic floor dysfunction, I'm now trying to assess how severe it is. Is it severe enough for her to have surgery? Because as far as possible, I want to avoid surgery and support her to actually see somebody like Emma or our continence nurses to get over their symptoms without taking medication, just doing pelvic floor muscle exercises. So for me, the most important thing when I'm planning surgery is, or when a patient comes to me is, how much does this symptom affect you? And what do you want? What are your expectations? Uh, and, and on examination, whether they have got a huge prolapse, for example, if they have the vagina and the uterus coming out of the vagina, and I can see that there, there's no point in that patient seeing somebody like Emma. So we have to be realistic about what the patient expects and what we can do for them. So that's how I, I may do my assessment list. Lovely. Thank you very, very much indeed. That's really helpful. And I think particularly emphasizing the point about there are multiple different people that contribute to this pathway. Um, it's so important to uh, understand that. And it must be really, really rewarding for, you, for your community physiotherapist when the woman comes along and has effectively cured herself with the help of a physiotherapist and you can say you don't need surgery. Uh, which is which is very, very exciting. Now, there are lots and lots of questions here. Um, there's a question here about migraines and um, can that affect incontinence? I'm, I, I, I'm going to direct that to you, uh, Rani. I've not heard about migraines affecting incontinence, but um, I hear a lot about a lot of migraines with miscarriage patients, but uh, I don't think there's an issue with incontinence, is there? No, there, there isn't a, in, a, in any connection at all. Okay, and now there's another question that I think I might ask Helen and Emma if they'd like to chip in here. The question's about, um, is Pilates better than yoga or vice versa? Or, it, you know, what is the best thing to do? Uh, I, I have a suspicion you're both going to say, you know, just do as, as many things as possible. Just keep active and, uh, and exercising. But I'm sorry, I, I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't be feeding you a line, should I? <laughs> I think the key thing is anything that's going to mean you exercise, something you enjoy, if I'm honest. Um, I love Pilates. I love yoga, especially women who are experiencing, I know we're going off track a bit, but pelvic girdle pain during pregnancy. Um, there is a lot of research now to suggest that that is a very effective form of managing pelvic girdle pain, which can become very debilitating during your pregnancy. So I would say do what you enjoy, um, but a little bit of both doesn't um, would, would be my suggestion for sure. Lovely. Okay, thank you. Um, Helen, did you want to make a comment there? Uh, no, only to, to echo what Emma's just said. And I think, you know, again, the more we understand about it, the more confident we can feel taking part in those in those classes, whichever one we prefer. And that, that's the key, isn't it? Just get out there and do it. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some interesting questions, a very specific questions here. Um, one, can you reverse prolapse, as in the pelvic organs revert back to where they were before? Um, and I think that needs to be sent over to Rani, because, of course, when you're a skilled surgeon, as she is, what she's got to do is to try and lift up those organs and then um, strengthen that hammock. And you do that either with your surgical approach or with um, various insertions. So Rani, over to you. So, so that, that's a great question. Whenever I see a patient with prolapse, my, my main question is, how does this bother you? And, and what do you want? And the choices sometimes are do nothing. And that's also fine because nobody dies of prolapse. So, so often women have gone to have a smear, for example, and somebody says, oh, you've got a prolapse, go and see Ms. Tucker. And she doesn't need to come to see me because she didn't even know she had a prolapse. So, so it, it's really important to judge. And I think Emma would agree with me that up to stage two prolapse, pelvic floor muscle exercises is helpful. When you have a severe prolapse, I don't think pelvic floor muscle exercises are helpful. But then again, you don't need to have surgery. You can have something known as pessaries. And these are devices. And I wish I'd had a slide. I didn't think about this earlier. But next time I'm doing this, Leslie, we'll do that. The pessaries are basically devices that you put within the vagina. And the intention is to hold the whole pelvic flow, uh, the prolapse up 
And it's amazing that it actually works. And I have numerous patients in, in Croydon who have used PESI. I use them in my NHS practice, in my private practice. I would always offer pelvic floor muscle exercises. I would offer pessaries. And women themselves are often surprised that they are happy and content with the pessary. So that is another option you can ask your doctor for. Lovely, thank you, that's really helpful. Now I'm going to move to Ryan, um, who's one of Emma's colleagues, because I think this is a very important thing and this is another way we're going to spread the word. Hello, says Ryan, I'm a male personal trainer and I'd really like to know what are the best ways to be able to start a conversation with my female clients? What are the main things to be looking out for? So um, now, Emma, perhaps you can help. I'm sure you've had this conversation with Ryan, if he's your colleague, but, but let's tell everybody what they can do because there may be many people like this or many men who are involved in healthcare and find it very difficult to talk about such, uh, well, such intimate and taboo areas. Yeah, absolutely. I think ultimately it's... Um, difficult for men because it can seem odd that you're talking about someone's vulva or vagina but Ryan and I have had many discussions and often uh, a lady might say to them oh no I don't want to do a star jump because I'm leaking when I'm doing this um, and and that's a real kind of in then to start that conversation but I personally think all personal trainers or fitness professionals should be screening all of their patients um, and there is something called the PFD Sentinel, um, which is a new screening tool, which has about five or six questions. It's a tick box. And essentially it is asking the pertinent questions to any woman. It's asking if they're leaking urine, if they are experiencing vaginal heaviness, pelvic pain, um, fecal incontinence. It's asking all the pertinent questions that may then suggest to that PT that they can have that conversation with uh, the woman they're treating and say, Actually, do you know what? You could go to your doctor and ask to see a pelvic health physiotherapist to help you manage these symptoms. So you don't actually need to verbalize it too much with a little piece of paper that asks these questions for you. And I would say as part of your screening process, which all fit pros have to carry out with their clients, they should then just insert that in and just say, you know, we're just becoming more aware of female health now. And we know that it's very common to experience these symptoms. We'd like to ascertain if you have any so that we can help optimize your training and therefore your pelvic floor symptoms symptoms so I think the PFD Sentinel is a really nice starting point for that conversation and you know what when you start that conversation women tend to love that conversation and they think thank you someone's asked me the question and they've given me a solution as to how I can start on my journey to improve my symptoms. Great okay now uh, Rani does cesarean section carry less risk to the pelvic floor than vaginal birth? Yes, there, there, there is uh, no doubt that it does, uh, but there are risks to cesarean section as well. We've got to remember that it is a, a big operation, cesarean section. And the other thing to remember is that most women don't have incontinence after childbirth if they do their exercises and if they look after themselves. So I think that's what we need to be focusing on rather than a cesarean section. And the important thing to remember is that once a cesarean section, always a cesarean section. And with each increasing cesarean section, your risk increases. So especially if you want to have more than one child, I think do not opt to have a cesarean section for pelvic floor dysfunction. There are other reasons, and I'm not anti-cesarean section, but, but be careful as to why you want to have it. And it's really important that you have a discussion with your healthcare professional going through the pros and cons, uh, trying to find out, you know, that you could have some underlying issues such as uh, loss done loss syndrome, for example, where you're at high risk of incontinence itself. So talking to your physician or your obstetrician is, is really important because cesarean section may not be the solution for your problem. That's right. And so even if you have delivered by cesarean section, of course, what I often hear is women coming to talk to me yeah. about, um, incontinence and leaking being a problem they've had a cesarean section but then they become menopausal and that's another trigger isn't it with the loss of estrogen um, at, at that time so that can be a problem too so no cesarean section doesn't mean that you're not going to have prolapse now there's a question here from Joanna can incontinence be corrected in elderly patients e.g in their 90s 
So Rane, I, I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to say here, but um, please, yes, over to you. So there's, there's no age bar. I have, I have uh, operated on women, obviously, when, when it was needed, when they are 90, 98. And I'll tell you what, one day I uh, operated on two, two people, one at the age of 45, the same operation, and the other one was a 95-year-old lady. And when I went for my post-op round, the one who was out over walking around the whole ward was the 95-year-old. So I think it's all in the head. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And, and, and as you say, you know, if they do need surgery, it, it's transformational, isn't it? Um, so that could be absolutely great. So really, it's much more about are you an operative risk as opposed to how many years have you stacked up? Yeah. But, OK, now there's a question here about can children have weak pelvic floors? Because my daughter, uh, somebody says, has accidents at the age of 12 when she laughs. So this is a trigger. Um, Emma, would you like to make a comment about that or Helen? Yeah, Helen, shall I go? Or Yeah, yeah. I'll defer to you on this one. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, if you have a pelvic floor and you're particularly if you're female, you can have pelvic floor issues. Um, and there are a sub sub subsection of pelvic health physiotherapists who treat ped pediatrics. Um, I don't, um, but it's a it's a great specialism. Um, if you go to the POGP website, you can find a pediatric pelvic health physiotherapist that just to be clear, won't offer a vaginal assessment um, because that isn't appropriate. But there is a lot, an awful lot that we can do with physio to help uh, continent uh, incontinent children. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunately very common. And and often I will see older ladies who have experienced mm. incontinence from a very young age, actually. Um, and so if you feel your child needs it, please, please do get them assessed. Um, a lot of it, again, is around bowel health, constipation. Um, but there's an awful lot that you can do. It's incredibly successful. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely refer your child over to that service um, for sure. That's really helpful. Um, and also, if that ties in with what Rane was saying earlier as well, isn't it, about how important that is and about things like Erla's Danlos. So you may not have full blown medical problem that's causing a change to the collagen and the tissues, but you may have a sort of a, a lesser form of that, um, which, of course, is likely to start earlier on in your life, not just uh, after childbirth or after the menopause. Mm. Now, I think we're coming to the end of our, our questions. I think you've managed, you've done a really wonderful panel because you've answered almost all of them. Um, but I do think that I wanted to flag up one or two things here. There's one lady who very generously, and this is brave of you, thank you for doing it, um, said that she was told by her doctor that it meant that she was having too much sex. Now, and I have thought, now Helen, I'm gonna ask you to reply to that one because I mean, I, I felt really cross when I read that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you know, it's not the first time I hear thoughtless or, you know, possibly worse comments to women. And it makes me like, it makes me really angry. Um, I mean, as a lay person, I'm going to assume that that can never be the cause of any of these problems. I'm getting nods from Emma. Like, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that's outrageous. I would go back and uh, ask to see a different doctor and possibly even put in a complaint um, because I'm kind of appalled by that. <laughs> No, it's not great, is it? And, and we don't really, we really don't want that sort of thing. And then um, uh, Mimi Lowe was saying, you know, um, I know it's tricky, but please be persistent with your GP and demand a referral to a urology clinic. And um, this is somebody who's had recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, and I must say, again, wearing my ambassador hat, I get a lot of letters and emails about women with recurrent urinary tract infections, um, and it really does blight their lives. So um, I think that's really, really um, uh, important to, to figure out. Um, and again, really important about lifestyle factors, you know, making sure you void urine or you pass urine after you've had sex, making sure about all those things, plenty, lots of fluids to flush it all through. And then May May Lowe also says, is anyone else thinking it's really quite rubbish being a woman from the age of 12 upwards? But no, no, there are enormous benefits. No, I think it's wonderful being a woman. I wouldn't be a man for all the tea in China or all the money in the world. Um, I think it's absolutely great. Um, so, um, um, what, what are the other things? I had one child, but three cesarean sections as there were complications 21 years ago. And in April this year, I had a full hysterectomy. Um, and I'm now on HRT patches while still recovering. What kind of exercises can help? So, Emma, 
and mm -hmm. Rani, what, what are you going to write? So she's had several cesarean sections and then complications. And then she's obviously had a, a super pubic incision for a full hysterectomy uh, and wants to ensure that she does her bit uh, for the treatment plan. Um, yeah, so I would very much encourage uh, pelvic floor exercises. Um, I think there's always this slight myth that because you've had a hysterectomy and a resolution of your symptoms that you don't need to do anything, but you absolutely do. It's really important that you're still strengthening that whole system from below, but also from above and around, as I touched on in my presentation, we've got to be thinking about the muscles on the outside, what they're doing. And because you are now menopausal, we have to be thinking about your bone health, and therefore we should be thinking about strength training use weight I am so keen on women's strength training because it's very important for our bone health as estrogen depletes and that can impact on um, on bones and we obviously want to reduce falls and osteoporosis so lots of strength training and do exercise that you enjoy and I I, I don't know how Rani feels about this but even if you've had a hysterectomy I would if you like running I would still encourage high impact it may be that we need to think about using a pessary as well but you know just anything you love to do so long as you remain physically active it's just so so important so uh huge kudos to you for thinking about what to do and uh yeah go for it but get the weights out that's what i would say great that's really really good advice now there's a very nice comment here from amy lawson who's joined us from the u.s she says as an american i want to thank you in england and the uk for doing all this work to increase pelvic floor awareness so well done team um, and women's health overall. All the useful resources I find originate from the UK and Canada. The US is far behind. Well, don't get me started on that one. We could talk about a lot of things there, um, but thank you for that lovely positive comment. And please look on the Wellbeing website because you'll see a, a whole library of films and, and videos of our webinars and resources that you can look for. So it really is a treasure trove, the Wellbeing of Women uh, website. Um, uh, Lily Lai has very kindly put on the POGP website link into the chat. Oh, that's the pelvic obstetric gynecological physiotherapist, isn't it, website? I got that right, didn't I? Yeah, POGP. Uh, all the acronyms can be a little bit uh, tricky. And then again, some more further comments about urinary tract infections and several people feeling saying very heartfelt, please, please, um, if you're having recurrent urinary tract infections, do push to, um, to get treated for this because otherwise it can leave you uh, with long-term problems with your bladder function. Um, <clears throat> so another question, um, can we ask about family members maybe flagging the issue that they might observe in non-professional capacity, how to start the conversation with a loved one? Now that I think comes down to the sex issue, doesn't it possibly, Helen and Rane? How would you tackle that? Helen, you, from your, <clears throat> your, your experience as, a, as a, a user or as, as a sufferer, and Rane, you mentioned uh, how important it was to talk about your sex life uh, when you were telling us about the importance of history taking. But just a quick moment before we finish off, Helen. It's so difficult, isn't it? And I guess it's going to vary from woman to woman and, and couple to couple. Um, <laughs> my personal approach has been uh, to try not to think about it. I, I wore a pessary for a time. You don't feel very attractive down there. You think about your prolapse. It's not the most kind of romantic setting. Um, but I know that people do have a lot, you know, suffer with pain and things like that as well. And a revelation to me was that you can see a psychosexual counsellor. Have I got that right? Yeah. Um, there are people out there who can counsel you through that. And that might just be the thing that you need to, you know, get that side of the relationship on, on track again. So, um, again, there's help out there if you know about it and you can talk about it. Quick, quick Quick comment, Rane, please. So, so I just encourage them, if, if somebody points out to me that they're having sexual problems, which is related to pelvic floor dysfunction, history taking is important. And I would encourage the partner to come and see me in clinic with the patient and we could talk through it. So it's just spending a little bit more time, not being afraid to ask, because when you ask a question about bladder, bowel, sex, you're giving them permission to talk about it. Exactly. And sometimes they may look surprised. Even your 80-year-old, I will ask about sex. And, you know, you'll be surprised to hear. So it's just asking, giving the patient permission. permission. To yeah. yeah, a lot of that, so a lot about women's health is giving women permission to say something, isn't it? Yeah. 
So I think I have to wind things up now, otherwise I'll be in trouble with the team going if I, we go over time. Um, I can't resist it sometimes because it's so fascinating and to have all these experts all in the same place. I'd just like to read you out a couple of comments. Um, one from Louise de Cal to everyone saying, you guys rock. So I thought that was really very nice. And I, I like to feel that as I'm as I'm aging a bit now, I like to think I'm a, I'm a bit of a rock star. Rock star. Um, so that's really great. But I know you were actually talking about the three expert panelists. Um, and I think the other thing to say is thank you so much for the comments. And also Ryan, who, who commented as a male personal trainer, because there's one lady here saying I'm starting in the gym this evening for a first session with a uh, personal trainer at the age of 52 and he's male and I'm going to mention all of this to him so we've got it out there you see yeah. that's going to go really really well so lots and lots of comments lots of links in the chat but I just want to say thank you again to our superb panelists for their honesty and their frankness and their practicalities all in their different ways as you see it was a multidisciplinary panel um, we needed a user a physiotherapist and a, and a surgeon so really really helpful and just remember that well-being of women needs your help and support not just to join webinars like this but we need money to fund research and education and advocacy so I have to do the ask so pop onto the website and please donate um, and then we will be able to do more and more and more uh, improving the advocacy and education of all aspects of women's health for women. So thank you again. Um, suddenly 30 new messages have come up. So I think it's all about thank you. Excellent. Wonderful. This was absolutely fabulous. Thank you all. Thank you, ladies. I'm going to speak to my little girl about the pelvic floor, she says. Wow. Um, and, you know, I don't know about you, but I've been doing my pelvic floor exercise as well. As <laughs> so I suspect quite a few other people are, too. So therefore, I'm giving you permission to say it, everybody on the platform. I hope you do well with your pelvic floor exercises. So I, I can't I've got to finish now, but the messages are coming in all the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It'd be good if we could connect as well. So all wonderful. So thank you again and thank you to the wonderful wellbeing team for hosting us and making it all go so smoothly, despite my late start. So thank you very much. Okay, and I look forward to seeing you again in the very near future for our next one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.